happy, happy Thursday. It's terrific Thursday. It's thankful Thursday. We're almost at the end of the year. And so we're so happy that you're on with us. It's also season's greetings. We're still in the month of December. And we're so happy that Jesus is still the reason for the season. This Thursday morning, we are also so happy to have Pastor Jason Peters and Pastor Nisi Lafleur on with us as we conclude this quarter, God's mission, my mission. We took you through God's mission to us, part one and two, God's call to mission, sharing God's mission, excuses to avoid mission, motivation and preparation for mission, mission to my neighbor, mission to the needy, mission to the powerful, mission to the unreached, part one and part two. Esther and Mordecai, and this week, the grand finale, the end of God's mission. And today, we are looking at the topic, Mission Complete. And so I'm going to invite both of our esteemed pastors to greet us all here on Whispering Hope. And then we are going to ask Pastor Lafleur to pray for us, and then we jump into our discussion for this week. A terrific Thursday morning to everybody. What an awesome privilege to be with you today as we begin the day together, as we start off the day together. In the name of Jesus Christ, I greet you and I pray that your entire day will be a terrific one. God's richest blessings upon you today. It's pleasant. Good morning. Blessed day to you. Let, thir let today, Thursday, remain a day of trust thanksgiving. Let us pray. Father and God, here we are once again, availing ourselves so that your Holy Spirit can feed us as we study mission completed. This missionary message, this missionary gospel, this missionary church, guide us, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So the topic for this week, the end of God's mission, and I'm also merging it with today's topic, mission complete. So gentlemen, as you think of these two topics, they're intertwined. Tell us what's your take on, on, the, on the topics. The entrance of sin recorded in Genesis chapter 3 caused God to go on a, on a mission trip. And that mission was the, the, the rescue of lost mankind from sin back into fellowship with God. What we have recorded there at the end of uh, the book of Revelation, the last two chapters, is, is a summation in a little nutshell form of what that end result would be. The end result of God's overall mission, the restoration of mankind back to himself. And the Bible makes it so beautifully clear that it has not yet entered into our imagination what God has in store for us. And so what the book of Revelation tries to do is to just get us excited about what God has in store for us. And brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, it's, 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 it's an awesome thing. And I can't wait to see what God has in store for us. Yeah, you know, I... I somehow thought that this lesson really summarized why I exist as a Christian. It's to be a missionary, you know. It's to spread the good news of salvation. And being actively involved in this work is necessary to fulfilling the gospel commission of which I want to dare say, none of us are exempt. None of us are exempt. Wherever we may be, we have the opportunity to spread a sphere of influence. And may we use those little opportunities to be missionaries because our church is a mission-driven church. Praise God. Now we're going to jump to our memory text coming from 2 Peter 3, verses 11 and 12. It says, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct 
and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. So, gentlemen, let's unpack our memory texts. And unpacking indeed, because this passage of scripture is filled, is filled. <laughs> Peter here is, is comparing two things, temporal things and eternal things. And he's saying concerning the temporal things, remember they're going to be dissolved. And, and many times we get wrapped up in the temporal things, my house, my job, my car, my expensive car, my, my property, and, and all these things that occupy our mind. And Peter is saying, listen, these things are going to be burnt. But pay attention to those things that are eternal, that will last forever. And he points out two of those things. And he's saying to us, if we make those eternal things our focus, we would help to hasten the kingdom of God. Amen. It is very clear that Peter is saying, listen, man, at the end of all that happens, at the end of Putin, at the end of Biden and Trump and everyone. At the end of the reconstructed World Trade Center, in the end, all these things will be dissolved. Not just broken down, you know, but dissolved. What manner of people we need to be? We need to be a people looking for Jesus, working for Jesus, and yielding our lives to him. And looking eagerly and anxiously for the day when he puts in his appearance. Praise God. You know, we're going to look at Revelation. Because, you know, this week we looked at Revelation. You know. And it's just exciting that when we think that when mission is complete. That we will be entering paradise. A brand new earth where death nor sin will ever molest us. And you know the greatest news? Satan and his host of evil angels will be destroyed. But the greatest of all news is to meet our loving Savior. You know, when we think of who we are and who he is, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. And so we're going to look at these two texts from Revelation 21, verses 1 to 4, and then we will look at 22, Revelation 21, 22, up to 22, verse 5. And you're going to tell me what is the scene being described here. So let me read these texts for both of you. Revelation 21, 1 to 4 says, Now I saw a new heaven. And a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more debt, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And then we go to Revelation 21 from verses 21 right down to Revelation 22 verse 5. It says, And I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or cause an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. 
And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its streets and on the side of the river was a tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. A mouthful, gentlemen. But nonetheless, tell us, what is John telling us here? John, John is giving us an insight, just, just a snapshot of what God has in store for us. And, and, and when we pay attention to the details, John is only describing the holy city. He is not describing the new earth. He is not describing the paradise, the, the fullness of the paradise of the new earth that God is going to restore. He is only describing what he is seeing in the, in, the, in, the, in the holy city itself, that dwelling place of God, the headquarters of God, the most holy place of the universe, as, as was, as was uh, foretold in the Old Testament to the sanctuary. And John paints a beautiful picture there. And he says there's not going to be any need for candle, no need for the sun or the moon, because God himself is going to be the light within that city. There will be no night there. And John paints a picture, and I, and I believe that John runs out of words to describe what he sees. You know, I wrote one word when I read these two passages. Paradise. John is describing what heaven is going to be like. A couple of things jump out to me. No debt. Satan and wickedness destroyed. You know, and the fact that from all people groups of the earth will be present there. It means that when the mission is complete, every human being will have that opportunity of hearing the message as we prepare for paradise. And I like how Pastor Peter says, just a snapshot, you know, because sinful language cannot describe paradise in its true sense. So it's just a snapshot. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Amen. Indeed, it's a snapshot because I know it says, eyes have not seen, you know, nor ears, but we fully can't understand what heaven truly looks like. Human words are incapable of its description. Am I saying it rightly, pastors, the theologians amen. in the house? I'm just a teacher. Amen. Amen. <laughs> now, challenge, how are we hastening Christ's return? So I'm going to make it personal now. So Pastor Peters in Barbados, Pastor Lafleur in Trinidad, what are you doing to hasten Christ's return? Well, first of all, let's just pay attention to the fact that the Bible does say that we can hasten the coming of Jesus Christ. That, that, that idea just by itself is mind-blowing. And Peter mentions two things in relation to the hastening of the coming of Christ. He speaks about godliness and holy living. And that is what God has called us as Christians. That, that is what God wants to fulfill in our lives. He wants, he wants to call us to holy living. That's the, that's the entire summation of the Christian life. And by the way, if, if we can hasten the coming of Jesus, the opposite is true. We can delay. And this is mind-blowing. When the Christian sits and contemplates that, that the life that he lives can either lead others to Jesus or distract others from Jesus. And I, I want this to sit on our hearts this morning. The awesome magnitude of our responsibilities as believers as it relates to the second coming of Jesus Christ and our influence. I want to just piggyback on what Pastor said, you know. 
it's mind blowing that my inactivity can delay the coming of Jesus Christ. But what am I doing now? This lesson has built a consciousness in me that I need to prayerfully use every opportunity to witness for Jesus. What a solemn call, what an awesome responsibility to be an ambassador for heaven in every event of my daily life. So I'm really praying to God that 2024 affords me the opportunity to really represent my heavenly father in all I do. Amen. Amen. The question continues. Are you planting seeds of hope in the hearts of those who need to hear the good news? And this goes back to our daily living. The apostle Peter hits the thing on the head. He hits the nail on the head. Holy conduct. Holy living. Peter is talking about our daily Christian life. And some people might want to talk about this is righteousness by works. No, you're already saved. We are in a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And Peter is saying, since you are already saved, since you are already justified, you have already been made righteous, you are already in relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus is calling us to live holy lives. And when people see us, the very fact that we are living in harmony with Jesus Christ, this in and of itself is the planting of seeds in the hearts and minds of those who are looking on. And Peter is saying, that is what constitutes the hastening, the, the spreading of the kingdom of God, the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world. And so what Peter says here is directly tied to the Great Commission that God has given to us in Matthew chapter 28, going to all the world. Amen. Time has come to be Christian. And so the holy conduct as pastor keeps referring to, it's how I live. I go to the market. It's not fanaticism. It's not trying to exalt myself over anyone else. But it's who I am. A transformed life lived in Christ is who I am. And what a time of the year we have to reflect on how have we reflected the saving knowledge of Jesus than this time of the year. I generally call it the Emmanuel season, Pastor Peter. Mm. The God with us season. Hallelujah. You know? The Emmanuel season. What a time to reflect that even if I fell short before, God is able to empower me. But I must realize that I'm called to Christ-like and holy conduct Amen. to witness to others. I want to say something here, Pastor Laflo, based on what you just said. You just triggered something in my mind. And, and that is as it relates to the Emmanuel season. One of the things that hurt my heart, and I, I, I don't know where we are on this, but I just, I just want to be honest with, with our listeners this morning. One of the things that, that really get to me is that many times as Christians, we wait for this season to debate whether Jesus was born on December 25. And, and we make a big show and, and we get so upset and angry with people. And Jesus is saying, boss, tell somebody about me. Just, just talk about me. Just share my love. Share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we choose this time to debate over the thing. Man, it, it's sad sometimes. The length that we go to try to prove something while people are actually literally dying in sin for want of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let, let's not make that mistake this season. And if I may join you, you know, this season has become so commercialized that Jesus somehow is left out of the equation. You know, we talk about Santa Claus and all these reindeers and, and so on. And so I honestly think it's a time for the church to bellow to the world that Jesus is born. Whether it's the 25th or not, that's not necessary to debate. But time for us to have some nativity scenes. Well, he was born and the reason he came was to save us. And so we can connect 
the Christmas story, the cradle to the cross. And we need to tell a story because the world is not telling it anymore. I remember as a child, you know, a lot of churches used to have Christmas program, all the churches, you know, the nativity scene of Mary and Joseph, even Adventists as growing up as a child, for A, Y, we used to have these nativity scenes. But over the years, we seem to have pressed it down, you know, but I'm thinking that, hey, we need to be the ones to tell the world, hey, Jesus came, he was born as a babe, you know, the virgin birth, and people are more in tune to listen to you about the story of baby Jesus around this time than any other time. And so let's mm -hmm. use the opportunity to do goodwill. And that's yeah. my two cents and all of that. Right. So, forgive me for introducing the Emmanuel season, but that's no, how no, I no. got to it this weekend. The God we can't escape season. it. <laughs> the God we live, yeah, and the truth is you have young children around. We need to tell them the truth. Is your parents giving you gifts, not no Santa Claus? You understand? Yeah. Because the TV, that's the story they paint. And so as the church, we have to take back the narrative that Jesus came as a babe. He, the whole story, to help people to understand his mission. And it all wraps up in God's mission. Because if he didn't come, he couldn't die. That's right. So, we're going to pray for opportunities at the end. And to communicate the promise of an earth made new, you know, for the people in our daily prayer list. So that's going to be a prayer challenge at the end of our discussion today. You know, so I'm going to share this scenario with you. You know, around us, the people that we talk to, some of them are our disciples, and they may be ready to accept Christ. But this includes joining a church or a group of believers. Now put yourself in somebody who really wants to be a disciple of God. Imagine attending your church for the first time. What kind of experience would you have? How prepared is your church to welcome and disciple new people? Let, let's be honest here this morning. Let's, let's talk. These are questions that really cause us to to take some serious look at what we do, uh, not just on a personal level, but as a corporate church, whether it's at the local church or, you know, globally. Are we really doing those things that Jesus has called us to do to invite men and women into the kingdom of God? Are we attracting people to Jesus? And this question is not just important to me personally but as a church leader as, as a pastor as a spiritual leader this this question has caused me to reevaluate how we set up church is it attractive it is is it conducive is it inviting not just for the people who look like us in how what we believe and how we dress and how we eat and how we think but the people who do not dress like us, they do not think like us, they do not, they do not eat like us, they do not look like us. Are we still attracting them to the man Jesus Christ? And, and if we're honest in ourselves, sometimes we have to say, no, we're not, we're not doing those things. You know, I, I generally say the congregation I'm, I'm at now, I have a very brave pastor, real brave. Young in the ministry, but he's brave, Peters. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I saw him implement was that every Sabbath, as much sometimes as three persons stretched between elders, deacons, young people, must stay to welcome, first up, and chaperone any visitor to the church. Hallelujah. Right? And... I remember saying to him that I want to watch this experiment. And then he shared with me a young couple, Adventist young couple who came to the church. They came into the church. Nobody really welcomed them or spoke to them. And then they left. And he encountered them about six months later in the ghost. Are we really prepared when people come, they may not believe like us. They may not look like us. 
But are we in a state of readiness, readiness to put off fortress Adventism and really welcome a brother or sister who may, quote unquote, sing a wrong note because they're there for the first time? I don't think we have matured enough as a body to be welcoming to people who don't think like us or even in some cases, look like us or believe like us. But we've got to understand that Jesus Christ died for everyone. And everyone who comes to our doors, Saturday, Sunday, or Wednesday night, let us be intentional in reaching to them. People just don't come to church by accident. Amen. You know, this is a touchy topic, but we have to be honest. The question is, how healthy are our churches? Are they warm, welcoming? If a stranger came to your congregation, would they return? It's not about the programs. It's about how we relate with each other, one, and a stranger. And like the experience, Pastor Lafleur, of your past, I have known of persons who have said the same thing to me. They have come to different congregations and they were not welcome. They did not feel appreciated. You know, they were searching and they're at home. And it's an indictment on all of us, you know, especially for persons who don't look like us, you know. And so there is a part that leaders must play. And it says we have to create a strategy to address our weak areas. And this is something that we have to sit down and realize that it's not a, a one suit fits all. Different church have different needs. Some churches may be very good with their usher system and their welcome. But we may have members who are unconverted because I have been at congregations and persons were asked to come out of, visitors were asked to come out of member seat. Now what happens? The person get up and never turn, return. And you want to tell me that your seat is more important than making a visitor welcome? And we have to be honest and think of strategies as to how we're going to improve. Look at our weak areas. You know, each church may need to have their own strategy, their own plan so that our church can be more intentional about one, how we treat new members or new persons, and two, how we disciple them. What are your thoughts on that, pastors? Neither of us could say it any better. You hit the nail on the head. We have to be deliberate when it comes to welcoming sinners into the presence of God. That's the purpose of the church. There is nothing else that God has set us up for than to invite sinners into his presence. And they, they may not always get it right at first. They may not. I remember growing up, uh, we, had a, we had a music program. Well, not really a music program. Just We just invited uh, people. There's this young girl. She wanted to do special music at Church Pastor Lafleur, And she sang the song, From a Distance, God is Watching Us. That song is not a gospel song. That song... Not that it is not a gospel song. The theology of the th is so far from the truth. And the song was not designed to be a gospel song. It, it was a young girl. She was not a member of the, she was not a Christian. She was not a member of the church, but she wanted to sing. Listen, when that girl finished singing that song, she got a standing ovation. Everybody knew the song was a wrong song. But how she felt at the end, she, the warmth and, and the appreciation we have to understand everybody who comes to us is not conscious of, of the rightness and, the, and of, of church behavior and so on. And we have, to be, we have to be prepared mentally to receive such persons into the fellowship and into, into our presence. Yep, yep, yep. We have to. It's a challenge. It may... But we also have to always remember that we have to connect with people before we correct them. 
And this doesn't only have to deal with discipline. It may be a false notion, a, a kind of twisted understanding of the Bible. And as we connect, we share the correct perspective, but we do it from a position of help and development as opposed to mere correction and a simple exhibition of our knowledge of God. <laughs> Pastor, raised, Pastor Peters raised the issue. What about a young man who gets up when his room had to do worship in dorm and sang Whitney Houston's song, I yeah. Look to You? <laughs> yeah. Right? No, what I discovered about him was that was pretty normal because that was pretty normal in his congregational setting. He was not a Seventh-day Adventist. And I, I mean, how do we know? That went like wildfire around the place, but then that was normal in his setting. And it was what? Probably his sixth or seventh week on campus. But we were able to ultimately work work that through <laughs> but that, that what listen when i heard the narrative late in the day i actually laughed yeah? <laughs> well, well look at it here two experiences very similar but the response different in pastor peter's church you know you gave that girl a standing ovation but you know in the other setting i can imagine the response, you know, how dare you sing that song? And, you know, it has to do with Christian maturity. You know, recognizing, because we have to know where people are coming from, eh? We have to know where they're coming from if we're going to be able to help them. And our approach is everything. It's not what we say, you know, it's how we do it. And so what is your takeaway from today's lesson? If nothing else you want us to learn, you know, we're well over time, but I think... I'm going to have to ask you, and you can tie in as well, what you are taking away from this quarter's lesson so you can save time. That my responsibility as a Christian is so, is so great in pointing others to Jesus Christ and in helping them to be ready. We cannot minimize the importance of every Christian within the kingdom of God and, and their individual responsibility in helping others to be ready for the second coming. So I sum that up right, as this. I found God in a missionary book called the Bible that told me the story of a missionary God who allowed me to choose to be a part of a missionary church. And in whatever circumstance I find myself, I am a missionary. Amen. Amen. Now, mission complete. Very soon, the words will be uttered. He that is holy, let him be holy still. He that be righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. You know, and we know the whole Revelation text. And we don't know when that's going to happen. Some of us may not be alive. And those words are uttered, which means debt can snatch us away. The question is, where do you stand? How do you stand? Should God make his appearance today? Would you be saved? And this is for all of us, host, panelists, and you. For all of us, we have sinned and we have come short of the glory of God. And this is a call to recognize that God is about to come. And so, Pastor Peters, I want a special prayer for all of us as we end this year to be committed, want to be missionaries, and after being missionaries, not to be castaways, but to be found alone, the free of life, as we looked at in our text today. I invite you to join us in prayer. Father, you've called us at such a time as this. First, to be in relationship with you, to walk in holiness, to experience your transforming grace in our lives, and to help others to come to know Jesus, whom to know his life eternal. 
Father, we ask for a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon our lives. We pray for a fresh experience with Jesus. We pray for a new encounter with Jesus Christ. That the goodness of God, the glory of God will shine through our lives. And others may come to know you as a, as, as a Savior and Lord and Redeemer and King. Father, I pray for all those who are listening. I pray that they in their own sphere would point others to you. We thank you for life. We thank you for grace. We thank you for sustaining us. There are many who started this year who have not, who have not been able to end because they have passed away. You've chosen to grant us life. We pray, Father, that we may be faithful to the mission that you have called us to, the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the sharing of the kingdom of God, and the invitation that you've called us to give to men and women, that they may come to know you. Bless us to this end. We thank you for bringing us to the end of this quarter, for bringing us... We thank you for bringing us to the end of this quarter oh god what a fantastic study about mission we pray more than our words can that your holy spirit impress upon the listenership their hearts that we all are called to be missionaries we bless we ask you to continue to bless this mission effort of whispering hope in Jesus' precious name amen Amen. And so we were so happy that both of you could contribute to our prayer this morning. We ask for God's constant blessing over your lives and over your ministries and over your families. And to all of Whispering Hope, we want to thank you for being tuned in with us this morning. And we ask for your constant prayers and your support in whichever way. And to our host, to our sponsor, that is, Elder Joseph, Elder Edson Joseph, we want to thank you for allowing God to pull this ministry together. And we ask God's blessings over your life and over Whispering Hope. And we just want to say to everybody, have an awesome day and God bless.